Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, currently, I'm postdocing with uh, Connie Weaver in the Department of uh, Nutrition Science at Purdue University. Uh, I've been with Connie for the past year, and she was very disappointed to not be able to make it today. Uh, but I'm really happy to be joining you here and presenting on dairy and childhood health. In the abstract, it does say that we're focusing predominantly on bone health. But given the, the prevalence and concern of obesity in childhood and adolescence, we felt it was important to also address this. So focus both on bone and obesity in this presentation. <clears throat> so as a brief outline for this talk, I'll, uh, I'll s first start with our dairy recommendations in the United States and globally, uh, moving along into the role of dairy and optimizing bone, uh, bone accretion and bone growth in childhood, moving along to obesity, and then summarizing and uh, providing some concluding remarks. So of course, when we're talking about dairy, we are referring to milks, yogurts, cheeses. Uh, in the United States, the table here provided uh, shows the recommended servings of dairy per day for children and adolescents. So uh, being in the range of two to three cups per day in children ages two to three years, up to 14 to 18 years of age. Uh, in the United States, it's important to take note that uh, low fat dairy products are predominantly recommended out of the concern for childhood obesity as dairy products are providing uh, are calorie containing. <clears throat> With a global perspective, dairy recommendations do vary uh, considerably. So again, in the United States, about on average, we're looking at about three servings per day. Uh, however, when we look into Europe, uh, France and Switzerland at about three servings per day, South Africa, one to three, Japan, two servings, Australia, two to three servings, and then in the United Kingdom, not exactly having a number set to it, so some dairy uh, recommended. So there is considerable variation here with respect to dairy consumption. Now it's one thing to make national recommendations or global recommendations for dairy or any food group for that matter, but it's another to actually have the population meet these recommendations. So the figure provided on this slide is from the U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans report uh, published a couple of years ago now. Uh, but on the y-axis, what we're showing here is cup equivalents in dairy. And on the x-axis, we have our different age ranges. So one to three years, all the way up to 70 years. Uh, our blue tick marks are indicating the recommended intakes for those age ranges. And the orange is showing where our actual consumption is at. So as you can see, one to three years of age, we're meeting our recommendations. However, after that, into childhood, adolescence, adulthood, uh, later adulthood, the, uh, you're more prone to not meet your dairy recommendations as you age, which is uh, of uh, considerable concern. So why exactly is it so important to meet our dairy recommendations? Well, as we, I'm sure, are all very well aware, dairy is a very nutrient-dense uh, food source. Uh, providing a variety of nutrients, essential nutrients, um, including some of our uh, uh, limiting nutrients, um, including uh, vitamin D, magnesium, potassium, and of course when we're thinking dairy, calcium is often king considering the role it plays in, uh, in bone mass accrual and fracture uh, resistance. <clears throat> so consequently, under consuming dairy and, uh, and these critical nutrients might have a, uh, have a considerable profound effect on health outcomes uh, later on in life. So again, as noted previously, we'll be focusing today on bone health and obesity, and we'll for first start with the role of dairy in optimizing bone growth in childhood. So adolescence is a very critical period of bone growth, uh, with about 90% of adult bone mass being accrued by the age of 20 years. So the figure provided here on this slide is sort of, uh, this is very commonly displayed. This is a very common way of looking at the attainment of peak bone mass. So essentially what we're seeing is on our y-axis, we have bone mass, and on our x-axis, age. Our solid line is what we would see with normal bone mineral content accrual, and our dotted line would be with suboptimal bone mineral content accrual. So as we can see throughout the uh, early ages of life, you know, 10 to 20 years, 
there's very, very rapid bone mineral accrual. And this is a really strong determinant of where we're going to be at in terms of optimizing our peak bone mass. So reaching our peak bone mass is very important because it's a, it's a strong predictor of orthopedic complications later on in life. So when we're, when we're speaking about orthopedic complications, we're thinking low bone mass, osteoporosis, osteopenia, and consequently an increased risk for sustaining a skeletal fracture. So various factors are involved in attaining peak bone mass, some modifiable, some non-modifiable. So uh, population ancestry, sex, body composition, physical activity or sedentary behavior, and of course diet is playing a critical role. Now, in the previous talk, Dr. Black sort of mentioned that there is uh, still a bit of uncertainty in terms of intervening on growth during this period of time. And I think this figure might provide a little bit of clarity on that. Um, so what we're showing here is a plot of looking at uh, bone mineral content velocity. So the rate of change over time uh, in reference to age. So we have total body bone mineral content gain per year on our y-axis against age on our x-axis. And as we can see, at about 13, 13 uh, years and a couple of months, peak height velocity is achieved. And a few months later, uh, peak bone mineral content velocity is achieved. So this is essentially our average uh, velocity curve. However, there is considerable variability um, across the population. So not all children are reaching their peak height velocity at 13. Bone mineral content velocity isn't necessarily uh, falling along five to six months later. There is uh, some variance there, again, with respect to age, race, uh, population ancestry, sex, sexual maturation, obesity status. Um, so it makes it quite difficult considering that bone uh, is, a, is a moving target, essentially. So that being said, um, it's understood that about 70 and even more percent of children and adolescents around this really critical period of bone growth, bone elongation, and bone mass accretion are not meeting the recommendations for dairy consumption. So given the role of dairy in providing these really essential nutrients to bone accretion, notably calcium, potassium, magnesium, vitamin D, protein, high quality protein, um, just to name a few, this can have a really considerable effect on bone mass accretion, attaining peak bone mass, and increased risk for skeletal fracture. <clears throat> so some of the simplest uh, design studies looking at the role of dairy in bone health in childhood have utilized cross-sectional designs, observational designs, looking at dairy consumers and non-consumers. So several studies have focused on uh, milk intolerance, perceived milk intolerance. So for instance, uh, the first study here in, in girls in the United States showed that perceived milk intolerance was associated with lower bone mass at various skeletal regions. So this includes the total body uh, and different appendicular skeletal sites, suggesting that uh, milk might play a role both in cortical and trabecular bone uh, health. In children in New Zealand, milk avoiders uh, were shorter, had lower bone mass at several skeletal sites, sort of confirming the results in the U.S., also showing that uh, children that avoided milk actually were at an increased risk for sustaining a skeletal fracture versus those who did consume milk. So this is a very important finding considering that skeletal fracture is really uh, our ideal hard clinical outcome with respect to bone. <clears throat> now I'd mentioned previously the importance of both diet as well as physical activity promoting bone mass accretion and ideally optimizing peak bone mass. The study here presented on this slide, uh, at, uh, looking at uh, boys and girls ages 6 to 12 years in Belgium, looked not only at diet and, physical act uh, diet and physical activity, dairy in particular, but the interactions between the two. So what they did was they looked at dairy measured by food frequency, physical activity measured by accelerometry, and aerial bone mineral density measured by DEXA. And what they showed that was that both dairy consumption as well as physical activity uh, were positively associated with total body bone mineral density, so very much in support of the literature. However, however, when they looked at the interactions between dairy consumption and physical activity, it appeared that the, uh, the positive relationship between dairy consumption and bone mass of the total body was actually enhanced in those that were physically active. So it'd be great to be physically active. It's great to uh, consume dairy products, 
but you get even more bang for your buck if you're both consuming dairy and are physically active. Now, a randomized control study by Marillas and colleagues looked at girls ages 15 to 16 years over a two-year period. Now, the, schema, the, the figure on the right-hand side shows the femoral neck bominal density over the two years uh, intervention. However, they also followed these individuals one year after the intervention as well. Kind of uh, summarize that then. Uh, but the dairy intervention group received 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. The control group consumed ad libitum dairy uh, throughout the two-year intervention period. And again, they measured bominal density at various skeletal regions of interest using DEXA. And what they showed was that dairy had greater gains in area of density, um, as shown on the right at the femoral neck, but also at the trochanter region, as well as the lumbar spine, again, suggesting that dairy consumption might improve both cortical and trabecular bone health in childhood. Uh, now, this figure, again, shows the two-year changes in bone mass. However, after the one year, uh, one year after the uh, completion of the intervention, it appeared that for most of the muscular for the skeletal health outcomes, there was a convergence. So the role of dairy uh, was mitigated after the uh, cessation of the intervention. So suggesting that um, if the intervention is not active, uh, then you know if dairy consumption decreases, the role of these uh, this intervention might uh, might subside. So again. Uh, obesity status, uh, obesity rates across in, in the United States, of course, are quite high. Globally, are increasing as well. So there's been interest in understanding the interactions between dairy as well as diet in promoting bone health. Um, so a study out of Connie Weaver's lab by Hill and colleagues in 20, 2011 now uh, performed a pooled analysis, a very interesting pooled analysis of three-week calcium balance studies. So Dr. Weaver's group has done various, various feeding studies in, uh, in younger populations. So this group pulled together their studies over, I believe it was a 20-year period, uh, in white, black, Asian boys and girls, ages 10 to 16 years, um, almost 300 children that participated in this feeding studies to look at calcium retention, which is a function of calcium intake and calcium excretion. So what they found interesting was that uh, at lower calcium intakes, BMI had no influence on calcium retention. Uh, however, at higher calcium intakes, calcium retention was in, in fact enhanced in overweight and obese adolescents. So on the right-hand side, we have calcium retention on our y-axis and calcium intake at our x-axis. And as we can see, as calcium intake increases, calcium retention increases as well. However, there's an additive effect of calcium retention uh, by calcium intake in those that were overweight or obese versus those that were healthy weight. So this suggests that if we were to promote calcium consumption, perhaps through, through dairy, um, in overweight versus healthy weight individuals, the overweight individuals might actually have an additive uh, benefit in terms of retaining the calcium. And because the skeleton is the primary source, the reservoir for calcium uh, storage in the body, this might then in turn benefit bone mass accretion. So taking this into account, Dr. Reber's group then uh, performed a randomized control trial to test this hypothesis. First, to look at the effect of dairy consumption on bone changes over a period of 18 months, as well as to look at body weight group interactions to see whether or not the effect of dairy differed between obese, overweight and obese versus healthy weight um, boys and girls. So they had 181 boys and girls ages 8 to 16 years. 50% were overweight or obese, uh, determined by body mass index for age percentiles, and 50 were healthy weight. Uh, all of the participants can, were required to consume low calcium at baseline, so less than 800 <laughs> milligrams per day. Uh, again, this is an 18-month intervention where three servings of dairy per day were provided to all study participants in the dairy group, and the control group provided uh, consumed just a self-selected uh, dairy uh, ad libitum. So what they found was that over the course of the intervention, uh, the dairy group consumed about 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day, uh, and the control group consumed about 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. Um, and interestingly enough, dairy did not have an effect on bone mass accretion over the 18-month period. Now on the right-hand side, I'm presenting total body bone mineral content with our intervention on the left, control on the right, and of course our healthy weight, overweight, uh, staggered there. So there was a main effect of 
obesity status on bone mass accretion with uh, BMC accrual being greater in the obese versus overweight or obese versus healthy weight groups, but there was no effective intervention and there was no interaction between intervention and uh, body weight status. So this is quite contradictory to what our, uh, what our understanding is in terms of dairy in promoting bone gains in childhood. However, there are several factors with this study and uh, with several dietary interventions when you're looking at bone health uh, that might help explain these null effects. So I've outlined a few of these factors here that you know, can really help explain some of the results that we're showing here in the Vogel paper, but also with respect to other nutrition interventions focused on bone health uh, in childhood and adolescence, which is a very, again, very rapid period of bone growth. So in the context of this study, diet was reported uh, by self-report. So of course, there's considerable potential for bias and error when we're looking at self-report. So uh, the role of dairy and calcium on bone mass accretion might be greatest in those with lower consumption. So if we're relying on baseline calcium intake as sort of a inclusion criteria based on self-report, there might be uh, difficulty in identifying those that actually, in fact, have low calcium consumption. Um, and, of course, uh, tracking the compliance to the intervention throughout the intervention. So tracking calcium consumption as well as intervention compliance. Uh, this also lends, leads itself into the next point here that the study was free live in free living conditions. So, again, Dr. Weaver's lab has done considerable work in terms of living, live in research studies. Uh, for children and adolescents, this study was in a live, uh, f free living uh, situation. So, of course, over 18 months, you can't bring uh, children in and have them live on site. That's just not feasible, unfortunately. Um, so there's, of course, difficulty in, in tracking compliance and making sure that the intervention is being delivered in an effective way. And finally, uh, as I sort of showed earlier with the bone mineral content velocity slide, and our peak bone mass slide, the timing and tempo of bone growth are dependent upon a variety of factors. And childhood is a very, very rapid period of bone growth. So again, age, sex, population, ancestry, sexual maturation, body weight status, these are all factors that are contributing to the timing and tempo of bone growth uh, and the rate of bone growth. And they're also interacting with one another. So it makes the story a bit even more difficult. So again, sort of highlighting the fact that bone mass is a moving target and um, it can be a bit difficult to intervene. So it's important to really match for these critical confounders, namely body composition and sexual maturation to, making, to make sure that the trajectories of growth are at a common uh, baseline point. So we make sure that uh, we're able to adequately capture the effect of our intervention on our outcome of interest, in this, in this case, bone mass. So of course, these, this was just a very, very brief snapshot of the total story regarding the role of dairy in attaining peak bone mass. If you're interested in this uh, area of work, I would definitely suggest reading uh, Dr. Weaver's uh, update on the consensus of the dietary and lifestyle factors involved in the attainment of peak bone mass. This group provided a, a well-needed update to the 2000 uh, peak bone mass consensus paper published by Bob Heaney and uh, it's a really, really great paper. It's kind of the Bible for all uh, nutrition, physical activity, lifestyle factors involved in, in pediatric bone growth. Uh, so what they essentially did was they looked at the different lifestyle factors, including diet, physical activity, um, risk behaviors, in terms of their role, the, the current state of evidence from, two th from the year 2000 in terms of their role in attaining peak bone mass, and what they did was they graded each of these factors, A to D, for the level of evidence. And what they found was, what they suggested was that uh, the benefit of dairy on bone health, the totality of evidence, was graded at about a B, suggesting moderate evidence for a role of dairy in optimizing uh, peak bone mass. Now, to put this in, in perspective, we can think, wow, a B is a very great score. That's a passing grade. I'll take that. But also, why exactly is it not an A? So in the context of peak bone mass and, and nutrition, it's quite rare to have um, dietary, strat uh, dietary factors receive a grade of A for peak bone mass. So just a few of the nutrients that were, that were outlined in the paper, calcium received a grade of A, vitamin D, which of course is, is considered a very, uh, very important factor with respect to bone health, similar to dairy received a grade of B, 
physical activity a grade of A, and most other nutrients received a grade of C and D. So very interestingly, again, dairy received a grade of B, suggesting uh, moderate evidence in support of a role of obtaining peak bone mass. Now, yesterday we had sort of, it was brought up the importance of uh, discussing infant nutrition. Now, I'm pr primarily focusing here on childhood nutrition. However, they do also go through infant nutrition. And as we can see with respect to the duration of breastfeeding, uh, breastfeeding versus formula feeding, uh, enriched formula feeding, the role of these different factors in obtaining peak bone mass, uh, the evidence was not uh, considerably great. So they all received grades of D. So there is, uh, this is an area that certainly needs more studies. It's of course very difficult to perform uh, randomized controlled trials in this area, but well-controlled observational studies are, are certainly needed. Now sort of shifting gears here very briefly to obesity. <clears throat> I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but obesity of course is a very, uh, very serious public health concern not only in the United States, but globally. So in the United States, we're at about one third of our children and adolescents are considered overweight or obese. And globally, uh, hundreds of millions of children are afflicted with obesity. And of course, there are various factors contributing to obesity progression, genetics, physical inactivity, poor diet quality, and of course, a myriad of other factors contributing to excess adiposity. Now, excess adiposity during childhood can then set the stage for serious ram health ramifications uh, later on in life, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, just to name a few. So there's a, there's a thought currently that, uh, based on observational data that, and, and some animal studies, that dairy might in fact be anti-obesogenic. So several mechanisms of action have been uh, have been brought to the forefront, such as displacing higher cal caloric drinks, such as sodas, um, sugar-sweetened beverages, modulations to satiety, fat metabolism, as well as fat absorption. Uh, recently, there was a meta-analysis published by Wang and colleagues looking at the relationships between dairy as well as milk consumption and risk for obesity in childhood and adolescents. Uh, taking into account uh, the rich data, uh, the rich studies that have been published that are predominantly cross-sectional um, observational studies. And what these authors showed was that, uh, well, this figure shows the risk of obesity with respect to total dairy consumption. And as we can see, overall, there was a lower risk for obesity uh, with greater dairy consumption. They also performed these analyses focus primarily uh, on milk consumption, as well as in children and adults, and it appeared that these relationships were consistent throughout. However, one of the major limitations of the totality of the body of evidence relating dairy and obesity risk is that most of these studies uh, are observational. So it's very difficult and often inappropriate to infer causality based on these studies. Now, I've highlighted two recently, recently published papers in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that uh, are very, very well controlled, uh, randomized trial, randomized studies, uh, nutrition interventions, looking at the effects of dairy on various health outcomes, uh, including measures of adiposity. So the first paper at the top there by Kara Vogel is actually the paper that I presented previously at a Dr. Weaver's lab looking at bone mineral content changes over 18 months. Whereas this paper was, whereas this study was uh, powered off of total body bone mineral content, they also presented data on various adiposity measurements measured by DEXA, um, so total body fat mass, percent body fat, and various anthropometric indices. Um, and then the second paper by Joan Lappy's group out of the University of Creighton, they also present data on both bone, uh, not in this paper, bone is in a separate paper, but this paper is predominantly focused on measures of adiposity, and this study is interesting in that they actually powered off of percent body fat. So this is their primary focus here. Um, and interestingly enough, both of these studies found no effect of dairy on weight gain or adiposity, regardless of body weight status. So they also looked at intervention, uh, the effect of intervention uh, within the context of overweight and obesity. Um, so again, these are in stark contrast to the observational data suggesting that dairy might in fact be anti-obesogenic, but these studies are showing that there's a null effect 
Um, again, if you're interested in these papers, I would definitely suggest reading through. Uh, the journal did a really nice job of coupling these together to sort of drive home the point uh, and importance of these results um, to sort of help generate some discussion. Uh, Dr. Babbitt Zemel out of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia also provided a really nice editorial for, this, for these two studies. She did a really great job of summarizing the results with respect to the importance of dairy in bone accrual, as well as uh, maybe the misconception or the potential of dairy being anti-obesogenic. Um, she goes on to suggest that where we're sort of at in terms of promoting calcium consumption and where the recommendations are at, it's important to meet with respect to, respect to bone, health, uh, bone health in childhood, but the jury is still out in terms of obesity prevention. So just in brief summary, uh, as we saw from our cross-sectional prospective and intervention studies, uh, the totality of the evidence supports a positive influence of dairy on bone growth. And again, the National Osteoporosis Foundation consensus paper on the determinants of peak bone mass graded dairy at a grade of B for moderate evidence. Again, with focused on obesity here, the observational, so our cross-sectional and prospective studies suggest that dairy is protective from obesity. However, our intervention studies, especially the two most recent studies by Connie, uh, Connie Weaver's group and Joan Lappy's group, were in contrast to this showing a null effect of dairy on uh, adiposity indices in children and adolescents. So there are still several gaps in knowledge that I think it's important to be addressed. So I'm just going to bring up a few of these. So it's really important, again, to take into account the fact that the, the majority of this evidence linking dairy and various health outcomes in childhood uh, are based on observational data, so cross-sectional and prospective studies. These studies do provide a great deal of insight uh, in terms of the potential role of dairy in optimizing pediatric health. But again, there's various confounding factors that are often difficult to control for. So it's really important to, to perform these randomized controlled studies um, in terms of bone growth as well as measures of obesity progression. Uh, second, kind of leading into that, uh, the role of dairy in obesity-related chronic disease is still relatively uncertain. There is moderate data suggesting that dairy might benefit type 2 diabetes progression, uh, excuse me, mitigate the risk for type 2 diabetes progression, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension in adults. However, there's a very uh, limited body of evidence in terms of these chronic related, these obesity-related chronic diseases in, in children. And finally, as I noted previously, uh, the evidence grade that the peak bone mass paper assigned to infant nutrition factors received a grade of D, so there's a great deal of work that still needs to be done uh, in this area of research in terms of optimizing peak bone mass. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening, uh, for the opportunity to come and speak with you today, and I'd be happy to take any questions.